Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics. My name is Gabriel Reed, and I am a member of the Dole Institute Student Advisory Board, the official student group of the Institute. The Student Advisory Board is a bipartisan group whose members can access many great opportunities through their involvement with the Institute, including volunteering at, programming, at programs and networking with our special guests. If you are a student and would like to join, please email us at dolesab at ku.edu or speak with a student worker after the program. A video of today's program will be available on our YouTube channel. You can also access videos of past programs by visiting the same channel. A loop hearing system is available to use if you have t -Cole hearing aid. We also have a limited number of listening devices. If you have questions about the loop hearing system or if any time during the program you have difficulty hearing, please alert one of our staff members. After the program, we will have some time for the audience to ask questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand and a student worker with a microphone will come to you. Please stand if you are able to and just ask one brief question. If you are part of our, if you are part of our virtual audience, you may submit questions at dolequestions at ku.edu. The Dole Institute's mission is to foster civil and respectful discussion around important and often difficult topics. Please phrase your questions with this in mind. Before we begin, I'd like to remind you to please turn off your cell phones. And now please join me in welcoming Director Audrey Coleman. Thank you, Gabriel, for that warm welcome this evening. Good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be with you. Uh, welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics, and thank you for joining us for this evening's program, Celebrating Black History Month, a conversation on race. In February, our nation comes together to recognize the contributions, achievements, and sacrifices made by African Americans. We're grateful tonight that our very own senior associate director, Dr. Barbara Ballard, will moderate this important and student-initiated program series. Before I introduce tonight's guests, please turn to the back of your program to see some upcoming events here at the Institute. Be sure to return for the next installment of this year's Fort Leavenworth series. World Leaders in Wartime next Wednesday, March 6th at 3 p.m. Uh, we're pleased to host Lieutenant Colonel Nathan Jennings of the U.S. Army Command and General Staff College for a discussion on Winfield Scott. And after, we've got a break coming up here at KU. Whew, after this break, please join us for the continuation of this spring's discussion group series, Obstacles and Opportunities, on Tuesday, March 19th at 4 p.m. Our spring 2024 Dole Fellow, Karen Willey, will moderate a panel on renewable energy options and hurdles here in Kansas. And finally, my last preview for you, uh, join us on Monday, March 25th at 7 p.m. for a program you really won't want to miss, our spring 2024 Student Advisory Board program, Kansas Speaks, The Crossroads of Policy and Public Opinion. Our own SAB coordinator, Ali Hagar, will lead a conversation on the 2023 Kansas Speaks Policy Survey which is uh, out of Fort Hayes State University and the Docking Institute. She's going to be interviewing poll contributor Alexandra Middlewood and Kansas State representatives Christina Haswood and Nick Ho Hoheisel, both of, both of whom are members of the Kansas Future Caucus, an organization that is dedicated to bridging bipartisan divides uh, in this new, new millennial era for this new millennial generation, a really fantastic group. Now it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's guests. Deborah Dandridge has served as a field archivist and curator of the African American Collection for the University of Kansas Libraries, Kansas Collection at the Kenneth Spencer Research Library since 1989. She's a co-researcher and writer of the Brown Foundation's National Traveling Exhibit in Pursuit of Freedom and Equality, Kansas and the African American Public School Experience, 1855 to 1955. In 2020, Deborah received the Dorothy Parker Award from the Association for the Study of American Life and History. And I consider myself a mentee of hers. She and I worked together 20 years ago at the very start of my career when I was a baby archivist. And I'm indebted to her for her mentorship and so pleased to have her here for that reason. Sean Alexander serves as the chair of the Department of African and African American Studies and director of the Langston Hughes Center here at KU. His research concentrates on African-American social and intellectual history in the 19th and 20th centuries. Professor Alexander received his PhD from the W.E.B. Du Bois Department of Afro-American Studies at the University of Maryland in Amherst, and previously taught at the University of Massachusetts, Amherst College, Gettysburg College, and Yale University. 
Please join me in welcoming Deborah Dandridge, Sean Alexander, and our moderator, Dr. Barbara Ballard. Well, good evening. It is an absolute pleasure to have you with us. And I just want to start by saying thank you to our Dole Student Advisory Board. We always let them know what our programs are, and they have the opportunity to uh, volunteer if they want to help with this program, and I'm so pleased that they wanted to uh, join us this evening as well. And I am thrilled with my two guests. Um, it's, I've, had, I've asked my person to my left several times, and she's always been busy or has something else to do. And I was so pleasantly surprised when she said, yes, I'll do it. And Sean Alexander was thrilled as well. So we know that February is designated as Black History Month. For the benefit of those who may not know the origin of Black History Month, we will cover that a little later. But every Black History Month has a theme. And this year's theme is African Americans and the arts. And we thought we would talk a little bit about the arts, and then we will get into black history and all the other things we want to talk about around a conversation on race. But first, I'll ask Deborah if she would just say a few words, and we have a very short video for you. Uh, about? <laughs> William Foster. Oh, 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 with, oh, yeah, William Foster. William Foster was um, a graduate of, of uh, the University of Kansas. He, had, he came to KU from Sumner High School, which was the only African-American high school established in the state of Kansas. He is the son of a rail way um, carrier, mail carrier, and uh, knowing at that particular time that was sort of the upper middle class for African Americans, it was job security and a variety of other uh, advantages to having in those positions. And he, he was fantastic in his, at Sumner High, he was in, not only in a band and directing, but he played a variety of instruments. So this was his whole life, and so by the time he graduated from KU. He was already in the area of uh, directing bands. And so he becomes, um, he gets additional degrees and finally his PhD. And, but all during this time, he moves around to the various HBCUs and gets, gets positions there. And then uh, finally he comes to FAMU, and I think it was in 1946, I think, in 1946. And there he, is, has in full bloom of all of his creativity and all of his power, his ingenuity. And the collection we have from him has all of the designs of his uh, marching band. And he revolutionized uh, marching bands across the United States. And as this is the pageantry, the movement, variety of other things, he gave it a life that the Marching 100 of Pam Yu is well known, not only in the United States, but around the world. So I got to Florida and I'm expecting a very good black marching band. And the thing I immediately noticed was that this was not just a very good black marching band. This was truly the best marching band in America. And the evidence of that was, you know, Dr. Falls at the time was president of the Bandmasters Associations. To be the, the president of the College Band Directors Association, and just think about all of the colleges that have a band. He was the president of that organization. He was sort of a brand for a band director before I knew what it was. Dr. Foster is a giant, not in HBC band culture, band culture period. What was the most admired about him, he couldn't march in the college band because he was black. So he never marched in the band and he produced one of the best marching bands in the world. For the benefit of those who may not know the origin of Black History Month, I'm going to ask Sean to tell us how Black History Month began. Black list, <clears throat> so first of all, I want to say um, it's wonderful to be here. 
and I get to be on the stage with two of my favorite people at the University of Kansas, which is just fabulous to me. So I'm, I'm very excited for this. Um, and yes, we had to, to push a little bit to get Deborah here, but I'm so excited to have her yes. on the stage. Yes, appreciate it. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so Black History Month. So Carter G. Woodson is the founder of Black History Month. Carter G. Woodson is the founder of the Association for the Study of African American Life and History, originally Negro Life and History. He creates that organization originally in the teens, in the 19 teens, um, as a, to professionalize, if you will, uh, black history or the study of black history. And he, he does that for very political or specific reasons. Uh, the way that history is being written in the United States is not uh, tailoring, uh, very favorable to covering the African American experience, in particular around Reconstruction. That's the way uh, that history is kind of ending at that period that they're doing. And so he creates this professional organization, creates a journal called the Journal of, of, of Negro History, which becomes currently the Journal of, of African American History. Uh, in the 1920s, <clears throat> in 1924, uh, he decides that he's going to uh, have a, a week to celebrate um, black history uh, and the, the education of black history. He chooses February, not because it's the shortest month of the year, like everyone likes to tell you, um, he chooses it specifically because of, of two birthdays in the month, uh, the middle of the month of, of February, which we just passed. Uh, that is the Lincoln, uh, Lincoln's birthday uh, and the recognition of Lincoln uh, in his mind at the time, we can debate that at another time, uh, of, as the great emancipator um, and the, the in individual who issued the Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, but he also, at the tailor end of that, or six days later, uh, seven days later, is uh, Frederick Douglass's birthday. Uh, not actually his birthday, he doesn't know his birthday, uh, but he chose to have uh, uh, Valentine's Day uh, as, his, as his birthday, um, a recognition he assumed he was born in February. Uh, and so he chose that week of Lincoln, spreading, covering Lincoln's birthday and Douglass's birthday to be the celebration. Uh, and that continues for uh, almost 50 years. Uh, as uh, Negro History Week, Black History Week, as we move through time. Uh, and then we come fast forward to um, uh, Gerald Ford in the 1970s, coming after the, 19, the Civil Rights Movement. Uh, and Gerald Ford, uh, by push by, by a number of individuals, uh, creates what we know today as Black History Month. And they decide to do it as a recognition of the entire uh, month of February. So that's where it grows out of. OK. Would you like to add anything to that? No, but just mentioning that he was a graduate of Harvard. That is true. Yeah, and, um, and after Du Bois did. He's, he's after Du Bois. Yes. Yeah, he's after Du Bois. And he has so do totally dedicates his life. 100%. Does nothing else. It's kind of like Sean. It does nothing <laughs> else but that. And uh, has multiple, multiple, multiple uh, writing projects. Uh, when when I you want me to just shut up here when when no, I went ahead. to uh, you know my undergrad was at Washburn and reading uh, his Black Reconstruction mm -hmm. just turned me around and gave me the confidence that I was going to go into a field that I just <coughs> loved anyway but this really showed because that interpretation and Washburn had all of the um, all of uh, Asala's books, all of their um, educational publications as well. So that was, he's, you know, it's, it's very much a part of my beginning in my field. I'm exactly. Enough of me, okay. If, if I could add something just to connect it to the beginning as well, I think is important. So at KU in the 1920s and 1930s and beyond, <clears throat> KU uh, had segregation uh, and they uh, segregated. So William Foster, what was left out of that is he could not be in our marching band. Uh, he was not able to be in the marching band. He could be in the music school, but he couldn't participate in the marching band. Um, and I, I connect it to because in 1936, don't quote me, um, Carter G. Woodson actually writes about KU and the racism that exists and the segregation that exists on this, this campus. Uh, writes a, a public uh, letter that is covered in a number of newspapers, in particular black newspapers, about how he could not believe that he was at a conference and he heard about segregation Hmm. and the school in, in the land of John Brown, right? And walks you through that history of, of Kansas and KU and, and how KU needed to change. And then he goes in the whole thing about how you, you write black history. But 
So um, that would have been the same time that Foster's here, uh, that he's writing that. that You're right. So, good I, point. Yeah. Yeah. I hope you learned some things that you did not know. Okay, that's part of what this is all about. It's not just talking about black history, but the history that is not really told. And this gives us that opportunity to learn more. But given the fact that the 2024 Black History Month theme is African Americans and the arts, how important do you think the arts have been to black history and the identity? Furthermore, do you think that the arts have been avenues of expression when freedom of speech was denied to blacks? Are you throwing that to me? I'm throwing it to you. It's always fun that we, we talk about questions beforehand and we just give her general ideas yeah, and then and Barbara then just whips these huge else. questions out, right? So, <laughs> well, um, let me say, no, Barbara whips these out with the help <laughs> of Professor Dorothy Pennington. Okay, there you go. It does have that cultural element, so that does make sense. So. Um, absolutely, I mean, I think it's inseparable. So if we're talking about black history, black culture, black arts, uh, black expression, is inseparable to the, the social political conditions and they go hand in hand. We can go back to the creation of, of music and, and the use of slave songs, uh, spirituals, et cetera, coming out of that experience. Uh, the work of art, uh, someone like uh, Tanner, uh, a piano, uh, an artist, and, and his work um, in, at the turn of the century, um, you know, it's always gonna be there. And what, what do we think of art, right? So is it, is it music? Is it artistic expression, meaning paintings, drawings? Is it, is it um, you know, plays? Is it some, something else that comes out of that? And, and I think we have a rich tradition. Uh, and they go, you can't talk about the black, black history and the black experience without talking about art and culture being tied hand in hand. And Kansas is, is completely tied to that. Um, you know, Kansas is a good example of that. We have arts in general experiencing all the way from Ms. Jackson and, and the, the quilts here that we have on display here at the Dole Institute, but also, you know, Langston Hughes uh, not being born in Kansas, but uh, moving to Kansas at a very young age. Uh, someone like Gwendolyn Vuxt coming out of Topeka, uh, Aaron Douglas and his murals coming out of Topeka, um, Gordon Parks and his photography and, and movies and, and novels coming out of Fort Scott. I mean, we can go on and on with the example of something just in Kansas, but again, you can't talk about the black experience in Kansas without understanding those individuals and how they wrote and talked about or painted about their experiences. So yes, it's, it's, it's hand in hand. Hand in hand. Anything you want to add? You know, seeing, seeing uh, the world through their eyes, through their um, creations, I think is very important. Because, you know, we're always, the question often comes up, what does it feel like being black? And maybe, and those expressions are being made, I think, yeah. no better than anything through the arts. And I just want to mention that at uh, Spencer Research Library, okay, we have uh, a collection, a John Barker family yeah. from Topeka, and uh, one of their daughters married Hale Woodruff, okay, and Nathaniel Sawyer, who was the first African American, the first president of the NAACP in 1912 in Topeka, and one of his daughters married Aaron Douglas. So there's there are ties to the Midwest, and particularly to the big ones. Okay. Well, they live married anyway. Okay. <laughs> and those, I mean, just to put it, there, those who do not, Aaron Douglas may be the name that most people may not know, uh, but Aaron, you know, does a number of of, of uh, tapestries and, and murals. But he really gets his, his push by the crisis. So if you look at the crisis magazine, the NAACP's magazine in the, in the teens, in the 20s, and into the 30s, most of those covers or artwork within it are actually Aaron Douglas's imagery, um, and the silhouettes especially. And, and that, that's Kansas, Kansas born and bred. So. All right. Well, I'm going to get into a question. Is black history under attack? Deborah. Oh, I knew you were doing that one. <laughs> uh, black history is always under attack. Exactly. Same thing I was going to say. So very uh, good. Uh, but I think that um, 
It becomes a focus now. This is just nothing profound here, but it becomes a focus because it's so rich now. Uh, before, you know, during uh, Carter G. Woodson's era, there most of the people who were producing the the academic uh, research and and projects were African American. Uh, there were there were a few who weren't. But then we began to see things change with Herbert Gutman and a variety of other people, Bill Tuttle, and, and a lot of them are, who were non-African Americans into the field. And so I think that um, as a result of it, we are, um, I think it's just being a part of us, of, of understanding what we are, what our country is about. I lost it. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I, I echo what Deborah's saying there. I think black history has always been attacked. Um, it's, yeah. it's, a, it's a challenge. And the, the main reason that it's a challenge is because the, the, if you explain the true history um, of America and include uh, black Americans in the center of that, which they are, uh, from the very beginning, America does not exist without the African American experience. Uh, America does not, you know, you don't create uh, the individuals that are moving over here from England, if you use the, the old pilgrims images, don't know how to build a house, right? They don't know how to farm land. They don't know how to clear land, right? The individuals that are enslaved are the people that are, are being brought in to do that work, and they're the ones that understand it. Um, and, and so just from the labor aspect, it begins in the development, and we can continue in numerous ways. So the black experience is central to that, uh, and the idea of what freedom is um, from the very founding of this nation uh, you, you, our nation has always had something to juxtapose which is not free, right? And, and using that, again, keeps the black experience in the center of that. And I think the problem of why it's often attacked is because it's, people look at, if we do, if we're honest about race and racism in the United States and, and the, the horrors that come with that over time, not to belittle or to challenge America, but just to be honest about it, the, it challenges the notions that we're told, that America is innocent, it's a place that has never done these type of things, it's never been a racist country, you know, it's, it's, it's never had brutality, um, which it's not true. And it doesn't change the history of America, it's just being honest about it, but people are challenged by having to deal with that centralization of understanding that. They're challenged with the fact that our Constitution is a pro-slavery document, right? The original Constitution has three sections that uphold slavery. That's perfectly fine. Okay, it is. We rewrite the Constitution numerous times. That's why we have amendments, right? And the, the Constitution was amended in Reconstruction and changed, but then we have a fight over that. But if we tell that story honestly and say, well, we have a fugitive slave clause, in our Constitution about returning property. They're not telling you to return a hoe, right? They're telling you about turning, returning a person. No one's fighting over a hoe being held in Maryland versus New York, right? And someone grabbed the hoe in, the, in Maryland and took it to New York and said, how can we return this, right? They're talking about human beings. That's what's in our Constitution. The three-fifths clause, right? Deciding how we do representation. While someone is not able to vote, we're gonna use three-fifths of that population to count for representation, which makes an imbalanced population, right? It's okay. The biggest one, of course, is the fact that we say that the slave trade can continue for 20 years, right? If there's not more of a pro-slavery document in there, I don't know what is. But that's part of the Constitution. It's okay. Just talk about it. Don't act like, you know, the Founding Fathers said this, the Founding Fathers said this. Well, the Founding Fathers said slavery. Most of the people that echo the Founding Fathers today don't really believe, you hope, what's in that Constitution, right? They're talking about other amendment constitutions. Um, and it's just the challenge of that. And I think the biggest thing, last thing I'll say, I went on kind of a tirade there, but <clears throat> the biggest thing I think is when black studies, black history is at its most attacked in this country, it's when they're making an impact when they are writing and things and making an impact in the nation, in public opinion. So it comes, I mean, 
in our, in our field of black studies, we've been under attack since the, it was created you know, in 1969 as a discipline. Right? Black studies have long, existed long before that, but it's always been under attack. And why is it under attack? It's under attack at that moment because of the success of the civil rights movement. It's under attack in the 90s because of the cultural wars and the idea of we're, cult we're putting too much culture into things, right? You have the discussion of the history test, and there's too many black people talking about it in the history to exams and not enough about Abigail Adams, right? Or today, you have the success, oddly enough, the success of the 1619 Project tied to New York, the New York Times, which is a, a, a thing that they continue to attack the introduction to that collection, not the actual articles that are in that collection, if you've ever read it. Right? Hannah Jones does the introduction. That's what they're attacking. They attack Hannah Jones. And the reason that they're attacking it is because that was published in the New York Times. And it told us an honest study of what race was like in America. And people read it and was having a discussion about it. And you have a backlash to that discussion of like, whoa, 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 whoa can we really talk about this? And so it's usually when black history is making an impact in the American discussion that we have the true backlash coming okay, up. Okay, and that's where I'm going to jump in. Yeah. Can we really talk about this? Yeah. When but, you say we're going to talk about race, mm -hmm. often people get very uncomfortable. Like, what are we going to talk about? You know, none of us in this room had anything to do with the race that we are. None of us. That was our mom and dad. None of us in this room had anything to do with what gender we are. None of us in this room personally had anything to do with slavery. We may have feelings about it, but when you start talking about race, people get real uncomfortable. And yet, almost everyone I know is very proud of their race. They'll tell you what their heritage was, who came from Europe, who did what. You know, slaves says they were brought from Africa. But it didn't say they were ashamed of their race. So why are we so uncomfortable with race? Do we have a definition of race? We discussed this a little bit on our can, Zoom. Can I go back to this other <laughs> Back to the other thing that I lost my thought. Yeah. Okay, we'll, we'll go, go ahead. No, go ahead. And, and that is, I think African Americans, you know, if there's an attack on black history, there's an attack on U.S. history. Mm -hmm. And African Americans have laid their claim in the, from the revolutionary time period because the ideals of the Enlightenment that, that Thomas Jefferson, my favorite slaveholder, <laughs> that he, that they were this in light of freedom and equality. I mean, that's the appeal today to everyone who wants to be, come here from everywhere, because those ideals are so unique, and never before had a nation been built on that. And so that hope was there. So when African Americans participated in the Revolutionary War, and a lot of the others did as well, this this was a hope for everyone. And so by the time. What did they say by, uh, by 1800? African Americans, the majority of them were here, were second and third generation. They were not people coming directly from Africa. They were, they were already here. This was their nation. And so as a result of it, if you attack black history, you're attacking US history. And I hope we under recognize that. We're an integral part of this nation. OK, that's all my point. Well, she made her point, did she? <laughs> All right. Give me a definition of race. Oh, why don't you throw that back to me? Because uh, so, she, cause cause she, she wouldn't away. answer it. Um, <laughs> so, uh, is, what, is it a real thing? What is it? What is it? See how she's, is it she's something that uh, we, can, we can identify in science? Is it something we can identify in culture? Is it something we can identify in any other way w w that an academic would? No. Okay. So, so race is a social construct. And the, the idea of race 
Um, it's not biological. Um, we, you know, we are a human race, we're human <coughs> beings. Um, but in the United States in particular, we have defined what is different and defined classes of people and made race seem like something. Does that mean that race does not matter? Absolutely not. Race matters in every single day of most people's life. Um, and it has deadly consequences most often in the United States for black people. But that doesn't mean that there's a biological thing as race. I mean, even in the, in the, in the most recent years, we've had a move, as, as Barbara said, of looking at DNA and testing. And it's a little scary to me um, because we're going down a, a slippery slope of getting back to its biological. And remember that we're studying, when they say that you, we've tested your DNA and you're a Sante, right? That's not a Sante from 1500. That's a Sante from the 1990s. And that's assuming that people never moved, right? And so what is a Sante today, right? And what does that mean, that people never moved and never mingled? Right? So it complicates things, I think, very much that way. But the United States gives value to race, and they always have, um, mainly because they had, they had as, as Deborah eloquently pointed out, the vast majority of African Americans that are living here in 1800 have been here for generations. The key point, going back to the Constitution just briefly, is the Constitution is a minority document. It's written by a group of people. Europeans are a minority in what becomes America. Right? There are more black and indigenous people in this space than there are white Europeans. And that will not change until the 1840s. Right? And so it is a minority document, and they're trying to define the other. And race gets tied into that. And an idea of racializing slavery happens in the 1600s uh, in the United States, particularly Virginia. And it begins to create these categories. And we have stayed with those categories all the way up to today. And we get you know, minute, like octroon, you know, one eighth level um, and of, of deciding who has black blood and who doesn't. But then you also get in the discussion of, are you black enough, right? You know, Barack Obama used to always make the joke that people would say he wasn't black enough, right? Because he's born of a Kenyan father and a Kansas woman, white woman. And he would say, well, the taxi driver sees me in New York, thinks I'm black enough, right, as they drive by. Um, so who gets to define that? So no, race is not actual real in the United States. This is not really giving you a definition, which I'm trying to stay away from. Um, but at the same time, it has real consequences. So we have to, it's a juxtaposing for us in the field and discussing it. And that's what makes people really uncomfortable to talk about it, to try to bring, bring you back to that slightly. It makes people uncomfortable because they don't know what it is, but they've been told what it is. Thank you. That's where I want to go. Because when we look at it, I, mean, I don't think you can define race. You can say the makeup, what it was light skin, dark skin, and all of that. But it is what no one really knows, but there's something about it that makes people uncomfortable. And yet, I have seen them very proud of their ancestry. So it can't be that, it has to be something else, okay? So then that would say, then why, are we in the United States so polarized? Why are we so polarized? And then when you say polarized, people are like, mm mm, they get really upset. I'm not polarized. Well, some people are. So why do you think those people are polarized? I see it as. Uh a status of power, who has power and who doesn't. And I think race is an easy way of looking at it. That's the way it's been implemented in this nation, not that it was fulfilling its ideals, but that's the way in which it's been implemented. So if you talk about race, um, you're talking about power. And I think influence and what choices you have in this world, uh, who does and who doesn't. And I think therein lies it, it's the practice of, of this pernicious notion of race. It's the practice of it that makes it so powerful and so frightening and not wanting to discuss it. Yes, because no one should actually feel guilty unless you have done something to someone that you feel 
badly about. And yet, people do feel guilty, but I'm, I'm not sure what they feel guilty about in many ways. And so as a result of that, if I don't want to talk about something, I just shut down, or that's my viewpoint. And it will never be solved if you can't discuss it. When I was in college, we used to talk about race all the time. And as a result, we said, oh yeah, so and so. You make a joke about it, you're going about your business. And it wasn't serious. But now, it's not something people can joke about because of that power that you have or someone else does not have. So with that, I'm going to ask you to share a black individual that you feel has not had as much recognition in history or that maybe most people in this room would not even know about, but they have made a significant contribution to this country. Gonna come to me. Deborah has the answer written down. I'll just All right. Go to Deborah first, no, and I'll come up with No, you go for it. You go. Okay. No, because this, the, you forced me to choose someone yeah. that's going to be. <laughs> <not>. <laughs> um, there are so. I mean, the problem of choosing this question. I usually, this is what I'm saying, is that I usually let it bounce around, and, and something that we said makes me think of an individual um, and uh, tell the history of, of them a, a little bit, because um, there's so many people in black America and, and uh, black studies, black history uh, that we don't know about. We can name a number of people on this campus that people should know. I mean, we, we talked about William Foster. Um, this campus should know who William Foster is, right? Uh, we should know who someone like Doxy Wilkerson is coming out of the School of Education. Uh, we should know these, these individuals um, on this campus and, and what they did or, or in this community. Um, you know, we should know someone like uh, Charles Langston. Uh, Langston Hughes's grandfather. Um, we we should know those individuals, and so I could. I mean, again, we can name so many, so many different people. Um, but because of the way our discussion went, I want to name um, just briefly a guy named John Punch. Uh, so John Punch is an individual who was held in bondage, um, not necessarily a slave, but certainly not free. Um, and it's a dis difficult situation he's brought to Virginia in the 1600s. And it's a difficult situation because, you know, unlike white labor who comes at the same time and will be held in uh, indentured servitude, um, Bunch, is or Punch is held with him, with them as indentured servants, but Punch didn't have the choice, right? Or, or somewhat of a choice, the same way the white immigrants had that's coming in here. So while they're held the same, He's not necessarily a slave, but he's, you know, again, it's not quite the same status. But Punch is important for us to understand uh, because Punch runs away from uh, his, you know, owner, the holder, uh, whatever we want to call them, and he runs away with two white individuals. Um, together, they, they escape their bondage. Uh, they're ultimately caught, um, and his, uh, they're brought to trial uh, over they're, um, they're running away and what they're going to do. Uh, the two white individuals that uh, are arrested or, or taken back into custody bondage uh, with Punch are given three more years on their indentured time. So if indentured is, is five to seven years, let's say they had to serve, and they've served four, they have to serve you know, um, six more years, uh, three more years. Uh, John Punch is uh, given the rest of his life. He will serve in servitude uh, for the rest of his life. He has no chance to be freed. Um, there is no reason for that. He runs away. He's held in the same position that the two white individuals are. Um, but he, he run, he, the judge makes that decision. We have many reasons why. We don't really know why the judge makes that decision. Things are changing in, in British-controlled Barbados around things, up in New England around things, may have been influenced by things that are happening. But the judge makes that decision and arbitrarily chooses that this black individual will be held in bondage the rest of his life. This is the beginning of us codifying race as a category, right? And putting it into a legal structure that this black man is different than the white man that is doing the same labor, held in the same class, 
next to them on a farm, on a plantation. That's extremely important, and it transforms the way slavery will develop in the United States from that point forward, and how race will really be thought about in this country from that point forward. So I always try to pick something from our conversation rather than, I hope right. that works. All right. Do you have one to, Deborah? Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. I, I do. <laughs> um, but noting that uh, the people, you know, all of us are talking about, some of the people we're talking about are, are their, their ancestry, uh, were considered chattel slavery. Mm -hmm. And knowing that, you know, we can never forget, and I guess we're beating, a, beating this drum, this slavery that African Americans endured and survived was unique to any in humankind, any in the history of human, any. And it's unique because people are reduced, and we know this by law, to chattel. That has never been done. You can't compare this with Pharaoh. You cannot compare this with anything else that we know. And for that reason, it becomes significantly difficult to make our identities human, capable of success, capable of intelligence, capable of making choices. And I think that's so embedded in this notion of um, race, in this history of this chattel slave system, and a variety of other things. So when when African Americans get together, particularly when they engage in collective efforts, and therein lies, I guess, the people that I admire are those who were engaging in a lot of collective efforts, starting, you know, starting from the revolutionary period and definitely starting into the uh, into the 19th century. And the Black antebellum communities were so strong. And in that sense, they knew they had to unify. The Negro Convention Movement, which has all gotten all popular and we all know about it now, but that, that was the, that was the ground, groundbreaking effort. And that was bringing together the churches and African-American churches, social organizations, and a variety of other things. And I think therein lies is constantly defying, African-Americans are constantly defying this notion of being chattel. And I think that's important. So, the people I have are, of course, all of the women who were leaders of various movements, starting for the, from uh, the club women onward. And then I lead up to Claudia Jones. I, I'm getting rid of this, Barbara. I'm getting there. I'm getting there, Barbara. Uh, Claudia Jones uh, is a person who I kind of became more familiar with, really, through our collections. I was working on our uh, uh, World War II African American uh, project. And I happened to run across Claudia Jones. She was writing these things about the, um, about the soldiers in World War I. And she was engaging in all of these activities. I was like, who is this Claudia? Who is this Claudia Jones? And so finally, as time went on, I discovered who she was. And she was a Trinidadian who, had, who was in the United States. I think your folks were here. Mm -hmm. I, I'm forgetting how she got. But her folks were here. And she was very much involved with them. Um, a socialist party, <laughs> and uh, she did things, and her whole idea was dedicating herself as, as a newspaper writer. She was a newspaper writer, did a, wrote a lot of uh, uh, booklets, a variety of things, and she was always promoting the idea of everybody coming together, no matter what the race was, everybody coming together and engaging in what was better for most people, particularly economically. And those are the things that uh, she finally had to leave because she was a <laughs> communist and they declared her a communist. So she had to go and she left to uh, Britain. But the out of her, her biography is headed by the person who is to the left of Karl Marx. <laughs> and she's one who brings the Communist Party in particular, comes to grips with their gender bias. And she challenges it to a great deal. And as a result of that, you know, she, she's really kind of um, way ahead of her time. And of course, now she's very popular. So, you know. okay. And she's, she's passed. You know, she's dead now. All right. I will ask. Uh, all right. It's done. Yes. Okay. I will ask a question. 
Now, every, one would assume everybody would know this person that I'm going to talk about. Okay, and I said we would talk about somebody that we didn't know. Raise your hand if you know anything about Congressman, the late Congressman John Lewis. Raise your hand. Impressive. That's impressive. Yeah. <laughs> and yet there's a lot of people that don't. And because this is where I want to end before we go to question and answer, and you can become a part of this conversation, Congressman John Lewis from Georgia went through the Zelma, Selma and Alabama march. He was almost beaten to death on the Pettus Bridge. He almost died. We had him here at the University of Kansas at the Dole Institute. He was in the LEAD Center in 2008, 2007, 2008, I believe. And when they, he was asked the question, why is it that you are not angry after what happened to you? And he said, because he forgave them. He forgave them. He lived. He went on. In fact, he marched with Dr. Martin Luther King. But he went on to establish his own life and made a difference in the lives of so many people. He could help with laws where before he was denied. That's why he was beaten and almost killed. But he could make a difference. And he lived long enough to be in that role, to be able to make that difference. He saw the change. He lived the change. And he was able to do that. But he talks about making a difference, taking the risk, knowing who you are. And it started off a little bit as a joke, but he said, we should try to not be in trouble. I hear somebody saying it already but be involved in good trouble, in good trouble. What did he mean by good trouble, Deborah? Oh, okay. <laughs> well, good trouble is making change for the better for everybody. That's, I mean, I, that's so grainy, that's tacky, isn't it? But, but I do think that, and I think it comes through different ways. And a people who, such as our folks, have endured a great deal, really, I won't say this really, but are involved in pushing toward a better community. Because if, if, they're, if everyone is somewhat satisfied and supported, then everybody can be. And issues like race and gender and gender identity won't mean anything. And I think that's the hard part. But only can this happen in a nation who has adhered to the Enlightenment ideals. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. That's good. That's okay. good. Are you on a roll? Huh? No, no, I think this is it. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I mean, De what Deborah said is, 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 is absolutely correct. So for me, Lewis is good trouble, if, if, you, if you want to look at it, that, that people would look at Lewis and, you know, coming out of the civil rights movement, being a member of the Student Nonviolent uh, Coordinating Committee, uh, the, you know, SNCC, as, as they were called, um, his activities uh, were challenging the state, uh, trying to reform the state, in some instances trying to uh, transform the state. He's not a revolutionary. 
I mean, I understand that. He's, he goes into politics, right? And that's what he's trying to do is reform and, and, and transform the US system to live up to the ideals that Deborah's mentioning that come out of the Enlightenment ideas. Um, and, and that's, you know, while people may label him a rabble rouser, a radical, he's saying very clearly, you know, I'm causing good trouble. I'm trying to do something for the greater good. You may see it as trouble, but I'm trying to, to do it in that manner. And, and that fits very much into what he's doing. And, and what, I mean, I'm, I'm a little biased here. I mean, I was taught, I, I was unique. Uh, I was very lucky to be in grad school and taught by the civil rights movement. My professors were members of the civil rights movement from the SNCC to the radical revolutionary action movement. Um, and the people that, I mean, I met John Lewis before I came here, and my first semester here was when John Lewis came. Um, and I probably caused a little trouble that day because that's how I met uh, Barbara, is because I asked him He I asked did him a, start trouble. I, I asked him a question that I should, have, should not have asked him in public. Um, but what was that question? I asked him about moving uh, HRAP Brown to Colorado and why he was moved to Colorado um, to a maximum security prison. Um, but I didn't do it privately. I asked him in the Weed Center. Um, <clears throat> and he didn't answer it. Um, which I knew he wouldn't because he's a politician, but that's okay. Um, but he, you know, coming out of SNCC and his, 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 his movement and trying to get what he's doing, coming out of Nashville and the first sit-ins there with C.T. Vivian and others, uh, ultimately being the one that pushes for uh, SNCC to join the Freedom Rides. Uh, the, the, many of the students weren't, weren't cool with it. They're like, we're going to die. Like, this mm -hmm. is not a good thing. And kept taking votes after votes. Uh, and, and so I was you know, taught by the people who knew John Lewis extremely well. Um, and we would often talk about him. And, 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 but that action of what he, he did and moving into politics and, and being the most successful one moving into politics, right? Uh, the long standing, you know, J Julian Bond and others made the attempts and, and made pr progress, but not the way that John Lewis did. And I think that that, that aspect is I'm keeping up that action of trying to make this country live up to a better deal, and I will constantly challenge it. And the good trouble really comes out. He does use the term, but then he also brings it when they begin to protest in the, in the, in the house, and they occupy the floor of the house, and saying, this is what we're doing. I've done this before. Um, and it's, it's, it's OK. It's, it's OK to ask questions and push for change. All right. Um, and he's, he's taught us that. I'll have those with the mics so that you can have your questions. And as they are coming forward with the mics, I will just ask a question. Am I not my sister and brother's keeper? Am I not my sister and brother's keeper? If I don't do it, who will? And do I believe I should do unto others as I would have them do unto me? That's what my mom and dad taught us. That's not to say we don't disagree. But it says we believe the other person has worth. We believe the other person has feelings. We believe the other person. And I will say, we want, as black people, as any person of color, as anyone wants, we want the same thing. We want to be free. We want to be accepted. We don't want to be judged. And we won't deny you in claiming ourselves. We all want happiness. We all want good health. So what makes us different? We need water, we need air, we need food, 
we need shelter. So what makes us different? Do you have questions for the panelists? Pardon me. It seems to me, you may not agree, but it seems to me that black progress in this country is punished. Mm -hmm. After Reconstruction, we had 100 years of lynching and Jim Crow. After the Civil Rights Movement, 12 years after Dr. King died, the Reagan Revolution. Mm -hmm. After President Obama, we get the Tea Party don't you think we are obligated to devote an entire body of thought to where white supremacy came from? And shouldn't we be de devoting um, you know, departments to that kind of study about where it came from and, and how to disable it? Because it does seem to come back again and again and again. So are you asking me, Mark, or are you both of us? So, um, Although we would probably agree on this pretty, Can you pretty solid. Yeah, I, I will. Yeah, I will do it. Um, so he, the question was asked was, uh, you know, it seems like every time there is black progress, there's a reaction or a backlash. Reconstruction, there is progress, and then there's a backlash with lynching and the creation of Jim Crow, etc. There's the success of the civil rights movement, but then there's a backlash in the 1980s. Um, with the uh, Reagan's policies uh, and Bush's policies. Uh, there was you know, the, the success of Barack Obama being elected president and then the backlash that we're still experiencing today, I think that summer. And so then, the, then it popped in on white supremacy uh, was when the microphone kicked in. Uh, and, and so the idea was whether or not uh, you know, we, sh we have an obligation in this nation to talk about uh, white supremacy and its, its, uh, its creation and, and its hold, if you will on the United States. Um, yes, I, I, I think that um, you know, as, a, as a scholar, as an African Americanist, as a person who has a degree in black studies, um, who oddly enough, after 16 years, is still the only person on this campus that has a degree in black studies, a PhD. Right? There are people with masters and things like that, um, which still baffles me, um, being who I am. Right, um, the you know that's what we study. We we tell, and it's not again to explain um, and 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 to you know attack the United States, but it's trying to get an understanding of how white supremacy does have a hold on our nation, and that it does pop back up, and it pops up in ways that probably most people have no idea uh, that it is around them and ideologies around them things you know, thought processes. I mean, I was talking to a class today and we were talking about Grant's uh, piece in 1915. Madison Grant writes a book in 1915 about how the white race is gonna disappear because of immigrants and black uh, migrants coming from the, from the south to the north. That's not much different than the replacement theory that we have being pushed around by people today. Um, and that is a white supremacist idea, right? Um, and, and, the, and it's pushing that notion. Um, the way that it is talked about in public and unchecked. Um, but it comes back to the question that we're afraid to actually call it what it is, um, to understand uh, that white supremacy does exist, and white supremacy has been an element of American society since its creation because of the creation of superior race theory uh, and holding blacks in bondage and, and trying to um, push a certain ideology uh, forward and we constantly do it. And the progress and the backlash, I mean, we could talk about the, the other stuff, but, but the progress and the backlash, absolutely. I mean, Carol Anderson does a wonderful book um, on that uh, called The White, uh, White Rage. Uh, and it was a response to an article or an op-ed that she wrote in the Washington Post in response to uh, Ferguson uh, and the, the uh, protests that came out of Fer Ferguson. Um, and she said, this is not black rage like you keep talking about it. This is white rage. Um, and, and, and let me explain to you why it's white rage. And, it, and she talks about the progress of the fact that you did have the first black president and you had a reaction to that. Um, and, and understand, you know, you had the first black president that checked all the boxes. His education was superior. His wife's education is superior. He has one wife. 
to adoring children, right? He, mixes, he doesn't fall into all the stereotypes. If Barack Obama and Michelle Obama are not good enough, something has a hold of our nation. Okay. That's true. I mean, <laughs> I know, I know. But the issue is, how are you going to get those in power mm -hmm. to support it? So, to support a course that is identified mm -hmm. as such. Can you name it something else? Um, because we're really talking about just power. This is what we're talking about. And maybe, I don't, you know, I'm not in poli sci, but I mean, I'm sure there's a category mm -hmm. there, sure. some level in which you could, and you could discuss exactly what you want to address and what we all need to address. Because anything we're ask, you know, you're asking for in the civil rights movement in particular, you're, you're benefiting everyone. This wasn't just for one group. This is everybody. And, and women found that out. White women found that. Black women had been knowing it. But anyway, well, but this was very much a part of it. So I think understanding all of these movements for equity, uh, for upholding you know, the Enlightenment ideals, benefits everyone, particularly in employment and income. I'm sorry, I'm going back to yeah. the marks. Let me, let me just jump in real quick, because I think this is important, building on what Deborah just said. The, and con connecting us back to the conversation that Barbara had. Um, you know, Barbara said a couple times that people are, you know, will tell you all about their lives and their past and, and where they come from. That was not the case until probably in the 1970s, right? People did not run around and said, I'm Polish. You didn't have stickers saying, kiss me, I'm Polish, right? Kiss me, I'm Irish, until the success of the civil rights movement and the rise of black power and the discussion of I'm black and I'm proud mm -hmm. as a number of things. And that's when the ethnic aspect comes into to being in a greater way than it ever had been. Otherwise, it was a push down of those ethnic differences and trying to become American, right? The great melting pot. We've gotten away from that. But the, the interesting thing and in to understand how racism and white supremacy continues to drive us is we don't talk about that today. It's OK to say I'm Polish or I come from Poland but it's not okay to say I'm black and I'm proud. And, and why is that? And it's that uncomfortableness that you have with race, that discussion of race, mm -hmm. and on some levels, the, 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 the white supremacist ideology that continues to hang around oftentimes. All right, other questions? Oh my goodness, okay, <laughs> we better hurry up right here in front. Oh, okay, go ahead. I'll let you call it. <clears throat> okay. uh, I want to change directions <laughs> back to the beginning, and thank you all for a very provocative discussion. You mentioned this is the emphasis on the arts mm -hmm. and Kansans, but you left out one of my favorite Kansas artists, and that's maybe because of my Southeast Kansas bias, Eva Jesse, who is one of these people who <coughs> most people in this room have never heard of. Can anyone talk about Eva Jesse? <laughs> Not you, Joe. <laughs> <coughs> None of you. She's, I don't know. She's music. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yes. 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 Musician, and uh, she was the first one in New York. She left here and went to New York to help me. You know. Okay. She was from Coffeyville. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. She studied at the HBCU that existed in the Kansas City area, Quindaro Freedmen's mm -hmm. College, that then became Western University. Oh, Western. Okay. And closed in 1946. Mm -hmm. And uh, she became one of the, an international choral director. She worked with uh, Gershwin on Porgy and Bess. Mm -hmm. She worked on Hollywood movies. She wrote, mm -hmm. uh, and she's left her papers to Pittsburgh State. She taught at Pittsburgh right. State. Th University that's why Michigan. I don't know anything about yeah. Noam <laughs> And Harlem Renaissance, she was a huge part of that. But it was also yeah. at the March in Washington mm -hmm. and was a civil rights leader. Right. So another great Kansan. Well, we thank, thank you, you very much. We, we do that. Actually, they weren't, it wasn't necessarily a Kansan. You know, and they were actually, I told them to tell one <laughs> not to do more, but I'm glad you brought it yeah, up. Yeah, I, I forgot, and uh, that's, yes. that's a thank you for doing that. Thank you. Yes. Uh, I, there was a question in front here. Okay. Hi, uh, I'm Jake. Anyway. Hi, Jake. Oh, thank you. <laughs> anyway, my question is concerned about, so you guys have discussed a little bit about uh, the sort of fears that come up when we talk about race within the United States. And I guess it's focused a little bit more specifically in the past 
like a longer time period. I'm wondering what conversations about race are maybe more sensitive that you guys have seen coming up in the past, say, 20 years that are le uh, becoming much more sensitive subjects nowadays that might transition further into the future. Who wants to go first? Uh, you mean with how they compare to the past? Is that what you're saying? Not, com not comparatively, sorry. Just like what issues nowadays are we sensitive to in terms of race that have come up in the past couple of 20 years? I'm up, aside from everything, what, what, do I just, <laughs> what, do I, what do I pick? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean. I'll start there, and then you, you jump in. So I, I think that you have, I mean, the, race is a weird thing and a weird topic in this country uh, because there are things that we've made changes with with race, and there's, there's spaces where, I mean, I'm, I'm often, you know, I always throw this Du Bois quote out there that all my colleagues know, right? I'm an optimist, but I have eyes. So I'm usually the pessimist in the room, um, which is not what people always like to hear, and so that's why Deborah's here to pull it back. And, um, but the, you know, so... I think the way that race has, has dominated politics in the last 10 years, uh, since the election of Barack Obama, um, I think is extremely important. I think the way that the, the I, I, though this is not new, I think the, the idea of race and what's being taught and what can be read is quite scary to me. Um, but again, that's not new. Um, there's been banning of black text, black history. Black history is not taught in schools, understand? <laughs> I mean, there's one class in the high school on black history right, an elective. So it's not something that's being taught here in, in Lawrence, Kansas, right, the Lawrence Progressive Kansas. Um, so it's not something that's really there, but it's, it becomes something that people do. But I, I'm frightened of what, the way that that's being talked about. Um, the critical race theory thing and how critical race theory is everything um, is a little frightening because it's spewing misinformation. Um, but that's not new either. That was done in the 90s uh, as, as well. Um, but at the same time, while I say this, this is where I say race is weird. I don't know how many people remember, let's say, less than 10 years ago, there was a TV commercial by Cheerios where it showed an interracial couple having Cheerios for breakfast. And people freaked out that there could oh, be a... I see an audience <laughs> going, yeah. There was yeah. people that had no clue, right? That, that, oh, my God, you have an interracial couple having breakfast together. We can't do this, right? And Cheerios started to back away from it. Now you can't turn the television on uh, without uh, seeing an interracial couple. Right. So we have, you know... Let's, while let's you just don't, say Hallmark, let's yeah. the Hallmark movies. Exactly. We you can't, know, Hallmark, I, I think they have, they have had every combination we can have. Exactly. <laughs> You know, not yet. We're, we're, we're a little short yet, but they're really getting yeah, there. Yeah. And when you see it, you go like, whoa. The first time I saw it, I said, Albert, I called my husband. Come, 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 come. And he came running. I said, look, he what? You know, and you think, why was I shocked? Well, somebody had nerve because it was going to cost them money. Mm -hmm. Right? Where before, they didn't. Still about money. And I'll just simply say, my mom hmm, loved Nat King Cole. And Nat King Cole, when I was much younger, had a half hour show on black and white TV. Mm -hmm. And people were so shocked that a black man had a on TV. on TV. And he didn't stay on too long because the sponsors didn't want to continue because of the backlash. Mm -hmm. Now, they're on, and we see all kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So that's progress, okay? Progress. But you go, so, so when we talk about some things, there's been a, a lot of progress. I know my grandfather wouldn't believe half of the stuff. In fact, he would have been shocked if I said I was a state representative, you know, because oh, sure. he couldn't even vote. Mm -hmm. So you see, there's been progress. But then we have this other stuff going on. But that is not to make people feel guilty, to make people think that we are holding them totally responsible. And yet, that's what some people want. History is not pretty. If you really look at history, 
I mean, there's been a lot of killing and this and that and the other. It's not pretty, but it's still history. And how do we decide what we don't want in history and what we will include mm -hmm. in history? And we that's have, the scary thing. That and that's the scary to... thing. And we're getting to almost time. Do we have another question? I will throw out while they're going to the microphone that right Nat King here. Cole outlasted Richard Pryor. Richard Pryor had a show what, for three weeks three before weeks. NBC pulled it. But, but I, just, wait, wait, just you're not talking about, I like Richard Pryor. Don't tell me. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I'm just saying he she was said his bigger. show didn't last. OK, but OK, we have this one. OK, right here. I don't have a question, but I do have a comment about good trouble. You know, I think good trouble is something that's good for everyone. It's something that you do. It's something that you believe in. Mm -hmm. And it's something that we need more of it. Right. And that's one of the things that makes our differences. Some do it and some don't. Thank you for that Thank comment. You. Thank you. Thank you for that comment. See, that's what I believe. If you noticed in the beginning when Audrey Coleman said it was a student-initiated project, it was right after George Floyd. And the students were meeting here, and they said, can we do something that's on the cutting edge? We want to be a part of this traumatic thing. And they talked about it. And then Bill Lacey and I talked about it. And we came up with a conversation on race. We didn't want to call it something else to sneak up on it. Let's just say what it is. And we, this is the ninth one that we have done. Mm -hmm. And part of it says to people is not to feel bad but feel good about what you're doing with your life and how you are contributing and making a difference. And there's no reason why we have to shy away from it. There's enough out there for all of us to do, for us to take pride in what we do. And if we don't like some things, we change it. Or at least we try to change it. And I saw another hand right Josh. here. Hi, I um, thank you for this panel. This has been fantastic. Um, I do want to pick up on a thread that Sean uh, started uh, concerning N. Ray Punch, um, a case that I uh, teach um, from 1640. Um, I, I want to note that in that uh, uh, sort of case, which is the shortest case that my students read because it's only a paragraph long um, in my marginalized bodies class. Um, they do not use the words white or black. They use the ethnicity um, of the two Europeans, right? A Scotchman, they don't say Scotsman, they say Scotchman and Dutchman. And then for John, they use the word Negro. And so I want to pick up on this thread um, that Sean started about forgetting and how part of white supremacy and whiteness is a great forgetting, mm -hmm. right? About where people came from. So we have in 1640, Scotchman, Dutchman. It takes 300 years for people to say, kiss me, um, I'm Irish, right? And so I wonder, can you speak a little bit about that great forgetting and the need to remember um, ethnicities that people who, whose great great grandparents came here had to become white, right? They were not recognized as white initially, besides perhaps some of the, the descendants of the Mayflower, right? And what that means for a population who, um, whose ancestors uh, came here hundreds of years. In my case, my family's been here since the 1700s in Louisiana, right? Mm -hmm. Hundreds of years after most African Americans. And the work, what is the work of, of those people and those descendants? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's your question. <laughs> Keep that to you, Sean. <laughs> 
So let me make sure I understand your question. I mean, I could pontificate on it, but so the, the act of forgetting as a nation and the creation of Americanness? The centrality that, yeah. of forgetting yeah. in white supremacy yeah. and the supremacy work. Yeah. The, the, the necessity of forgetting, yeah. right? You, I mean, that's, that's the greatest way to say it, the necessity, right? It's a necessity to make everyone one, to have white supremacy actually work, right? To, to get rid of difference within limits, right? Um, within whiteness, to get rid of difference there, to make sure that everyone uh, is, is, you know, is part of this experience, to make you believe that you're part of something, uh, maybe that you're not. And we can see that in politics. I mean, we'll also put a shout out to your program, right, the, on, on democracy uh, that, you that we just did. We, we talked about this to some degree. Um, and you can, you can find that on, online as well through the comments and, and others. Uh, so the tying people together, making someone believe that they're part of something, um, the great American experiment coming out of Bacon's Rebellion was making people in that, that 1676, so you know, a, a century before our revolution or rebellion, which, if, which side of the pond you're on, right? The, remember the British call it a rebellion. Um, and that's an important thing to understand on who writes that history and how it's perceived. Um, but the, you know, six, a century before that with the Bacon's Rebellion, when you have a group of individuals, a mixed group of individuals rebelling against uh, bondage and uh, the, the governor of, of Virginia basically coming to those whites and saying, oh, you're not the same as these, look at that case from Punch, right? It's not the same, you're not, you're not treated the same, and you, you're more like me than you, you think you are. That has been the creation of America throughout and creating that, that buffer class, as people call it, uh, a buffer class that will allow social control and, and be able to control society in a certain way and make people think in a certain way. And it's been there throughout time. And it's, it's subtle at times. And at other times, it's, very, it's, it's a hammer pitting pe people on the head. Um, but most of our lives here, it's been subtle and, and passed through um, our times. But I think times now and times you know, maybe 30, 40 years ago, it was a little bit more harsh of a hammer hitting us. But it's an important thing to make people think that they're all part of a collective good um, and that they have, they have a collective past, right? To forget that past and that difference. Um, and we do that in culture, right? American culture, you know, African Americans have a specific culture. Irish Americans have a specific culture. It has actually been molded together to create American culture, but we're not taught that, right? I mean, at some point today, you probably said the word okay, right? And you think it's an English word, right? It's not an English word. It's an African word. It comes from Wolof, a Senegalese term, right? But we have incorporated it into English, and we do. It's not a word that's word used around in English worldwide, right? So it shows you, again, how we forget how the, the, the nation is really... You know, truly, the weirdest thing about slavery in the Western Hemisphere is it created the first multiracial, multi-ethnic hemisphere through force. But it does that, but we don't talk about it that way. We, and especially in America, we don't talk about it that way. And the way that we do, because we do it that way, we have distinct ideas in the way that textbooks are written, the way the narrative of the country is written, the way politics continue to, to, to thrive and strive, um, and, and who gets elected and why they get elected, how they appeal to a certain populace. Um, that's a roundabout way. I hope I answered it to some degree. All right. What's, what's the work? <laughs> oh, what's the work? The work is to constantly, I mean, we're educators here, right? Um, so while I say I'm a pessimist, the work is to educate. I'm a Du Boisian. Du Bois believed for a long time, though he questioned it later in his life, that if I just tell people, if I just give them the information, they will learn. They don't know. If I can just educate them, teach history, teach economics, teach sociology, teach how race developed in America, if we can do those things, these are Du Boisian ideas, if we can do that, then they will, they will, they will change, right? And I, I, I am an educator, so even while I'm a pessimist, I, I have a dream that that will happen. 
right? But so that's I, the work for me. I, and organizing and yeah, many but, other but, things. Yeah, but, yeah, but there has yeah. to have that experience it, of yeah, organization. Absolutely. Otherwise, yeah. you can't just do it academically. Right. You got Reverend. Like Barbie. I say, that will have to be. You got Reverend Barbie there. Barbie. You got oh, Reverend Barbie's <laughs> hand. Oh, yes, okay. I couldn't see. All right. This will be our last question. And say, you're going to close the curtain on him? <laughs> <laughs> I did not see his hand. Don't I would like to uh, share an experience uh, that I can. I, okay, I can hold it. Oh, you got to hold it. Okay. <laughs> That's all right. That's all right. You can let him have it. It's, okay. He's not, he's not okay. going to no, be out of control. He's not going to be out of control, are you? Be, no. I, all right. I, but I want to share an experience. Um, that at our congregation, I mean, at our church, mm -hmm. uh, Pastor Duel and some others, we've been having prayer meeting every, every Wednesday morning. A number of years ago, we used to have a lot more white pastors joining us for prayer meeting. And periodically, I would say this, I'm not trying to embarrass you, I just want to share with you some things. And I would point out different areas of racism, not to embarrass them, but it helped them to see what it looked like. Now, I don't know what that's why a lot of them quit coming, white pastors. But one of the pastors, he's still here, he's a friend of mine. This is what he told me, I've never forgotten it. He said, Leo, you've helped me to see racism like I've never seen it before. And when I hear it now, I'll address it. He's a he's pastor, he's still in the city now, good friend of mine. He said, you helped me to see it. And I think what we can do is, in a in the attitude of love and compassion and trying to help one another, not to be dogmatic, but share the truth with love and concern, not to embarrass, but to educate. Thank you. That's a good word. That's that a good is, ending. That good is ending. a good ending. <laughs> Let me say thank you so very much for coming and for my dinner guests, thank you so very much for thank being you here. For and for all the students that I see that are with us this evening. To answer part of your question you asked him, this is a very small effort on our part. But to have people come, and I didn't see anybody get up and leave, and to listen to what's being said tells me you're in a good place and you're in a good space. And it says what my grandmother would say, you have a good heart. But all of that is important. And that's why I stress the fact that it was our student-initiated program, because that's what we do. Those were the young people that are living it now differently than how the older people are living it. That's where the hope is. They are the ones that are gonna set the stage as we go along. And this was just a small effort, but the fact that you're here, we appreciate it very much. And I said in the beginning, I was extremely excited to have both of these guests this evening. Thank you. Good and I'm so glad so many of you turned out to hear it. We're also on the YouTube channel, so if you have some friends wanting, they can check it out as well. It's on the YouTube? You're, yes. You're out there, didn't you? You told me <laughs> otherwise, Sean. <laughs> I did not deceive anybody. <laughs> I'm just telling you what it is. But it's on the, the Dole YouTube channel. Girl, you were good and you're looking no, fine. Don't worry that, about that, it. That, that, yeah. Advocating communism? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're not. In the, in the Dole Institute. At the Dole <laughs> Institute. Yeah, All right. Dole. And I hope if, when you came in, if you did notice, you will notice um, the quilts in the back of the room. And they're um, a local person, Marla Jackson. She has a little studio on Haskell, and those are some of her quilts, and some of them she works with young people, teaching them the art and how to do it. And she is one of those unsung people in this town that's very, very talented, and God has blessed her with all kinds of talent. Um, and she had it in the Capitol last Wednesday, and I asked to bring a few um, here. So if you haven't seen it, I hope you just look at a little bit of her detail. 
But again, thank you so much for spending part of your time with us this evening. And I hope it just, we gave you mm. pause for thought. Reinforce how you feel. Lovely comments from various people. We really appreciate it very much. And you know, that's part of Black History Month to maybe just put a special effort in to see that we're making a difference in the lives of all of our people. So again, thank you and good night. Thank you.